So staffing levels are much better today. Uh, we're still down a little bit on where we'd really like to be. Uh, we had a couple that didn't arrive as we expected today, so we continue to work on that. Uh, we're working on other sources of staffing as well, uh, and we're having some very cooperative conversations with uh, some of the other providers in New South Wales, particularly those that have had a COVID outbreak, so that we can uh, take advantage of their experience, because what we really need to do is two things. Uh, one is to get the level of care back up to where it needs to be, but also we need to make sure that we maintain control of the outbreak within the facility. And how can we do that better? Would you like to see aged care workers, for example, being temperature tested before and perhaps during their shifts? Could that be a way to try and protect residents? Well, based on some of the learnings that we've uh, taken out of recent experience, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner uh, issued some additional guidance to the sector just last night uh, with a, a list of things that could include temperature testing at the beginning of each shift uh, and a range of questions that triage and screen everybody coming into a, an aged care facility at the beginning of each shift uh, and anyone who comes in at any point in time. So trying to make sure we don't get COVID outbreaks in the facility is the first thing that we need to do. Uh, that's really important. But at the moment, one of the things we also have to manage is the outbreak that we have, particularly at Newmarch. But those are just gu guidelines, am I right? They're not mandatory uh, directions from the government? Well, the Aged Care and Quality and Safety Commissioner uh, uh, issued those last night. I'm prepared to make those public. In fact, I will do today, so that the rest of the community understand exactly what's happening. Uh, and, and for that matter, anyone visiting an aged care facility will understand the requirements for entering an aged care facility. I think that's reasonable. Um, and, and they are guidance, but they are guidance from the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner. Uh, and the conversation that I've had with her is that uh, she would like to be able to audit those. So they will need to be able to provide some evidence that those uh, checks and screening has, have been undertaken. And so, sorry, just to, to clarify this again so that we know where we're at at these aged care centres around the country, from when would you like aged care centres to begin that? And, and are you saying essentially now that everybody going into an aged care centre will need to answer a questionnaire about, uh, you know, their health as well as temperature testing? Well, Ashley, most people have already been doing it. Uh, so I've had a number of conversations with providers over recent times uh, particularly those that have had the incidents or the concern that they might have had an outbreak. They were screening already. But what we've done is taken the, the learnings from uh, a number of locations. We've compiled that and we've put it out to the entire sector so that they can basically just spread that information and knowledge across the sector. I think that's important that we make sure that everyone has the benefit of the learnings that uh, have come from various incidents around the country. So we've done that. Uh, so to the credit of the sector, I have to say they were already screening, uh, but we've provided some updated advice based on the experience and the information that we've gathered from the rest of the sector. Uh, and I'm sure that they'll integrate that into the work that they're already doing. Do those guidelines need to be extended to residential villages where there are obviously a lot of older people who are in that at-risk zone? Well, residential villages are administered and uh, managed uh, by the states, but given that I'll be making this information public, uh, from my point of view, they're quite welcome to utilise exactly the same sorts of procedures because it doesn't matter where an older person is, uh, they are still at risk in the context of the impact of this virus uh, on their general health. So we know that senior Australians are more susceptible to the um, uh, effects of the virus. And so it doesn't matter where they are, uh, a residential village, for example, in any state could uh, uh, just as just as easily utilise these this guidance. Just looking at the rules, uh, to be clear for our viewers, there has been some confusion about this. Should people wanting to go and visit their elderly residents, either in an aged care home or in a retirement village, even if there's no essential need to do so, do that? Is a well-being visit, a, a stop in for a cup of tea, do you class that as something worth doing? Is, is that counted as an essential visit? Well, clearly the, the AHPPC led by the CMO, Brendan Mercy, Arkin Murphy, is concerned that uh, senior Australians, particularly those in residential aged care facilities, 
uh, can maintain contact with their families and loved ones. It is really important to their broader and uh, mental health and wellbeing. Uh, for some residents, particularly those with dementia, it is very important to their wellbeing. Uh, and that's why the guidance that was issued by the AHPPC a few weeks ago was put in place. We've, we've put some conditions around visits. We've said um, uh, in, in a lot of cases, keep them short, a couple of visitors a day. And there's conditions like if you've been uh, caring for somebody who's got cold or flu or have cold or flu symptoms yourself, but respiratory symptoms yourself, don't go. Under 16, don't go. If you've been travelling overseas in the last 14 days, don't go. So we've, we've applied some guidance around it, but the thing that we haven't done is say you can't go. Uh, and and the, the advice that the AHPPC provided a few weeks ago to the National Cabinet has not changed. What happened earlier this week was that the Prime Minister and the CMO both uh, restated that guidance uh, and... Uh, because the CMO in particular and the Prime Minister also are very concerned that people don't become isolated uh, and we know that contact is important for the general wellbeing and health. And the point that I would also make is that just because we have COVID doesn't mean that the quality standards go away and the quality standards are very much about the general health and wellbeing of the residents of aged care facilities. What powers do you actually have over those aged care providers, though, to make them follow that federal advice? Because we certainly have seen that since the Prime Minister and Chief Medical Officer repeated that advice earlier this week, as you mentioned, um, some centres are still being very strict on this. I understand that uh, the care provider Elder Care, which runs 12 nursing homes in South Australia, is only still allowing end-of-life and medical visits um, with residents you know, not being able to be in contact physically with their families, simply still being able to talk to them on the phone or, or perhaps have a chat online. Is that acceptable? Well, we've asked aged care facilities to facilitate other forms of contact as well. Uh, but I, your question goes to the point that I've just made. The quality and safety standards do not go away just because we have COVID-19. And the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner does have the capacity to uh, apply... Uh, the rules that uh, exist across the aged care sector if aged care facilities aren't ensuring that the uh, level of care of aged, uh, aged care residents uh, complies with the rules. Uh, and the, as, of in, as I've explained, in some circumstances, uh, particularly for people with dementia and at, at end of life, uh, it's very important that they have contact but they're on the medical advice, on the medical advice from the AHPPC, uh, we're saying that there is no need to completely lock down aged care facilities.